My name is Dr. Bonnie Key, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Jack Crow Oncology. Welcome to our case-based discussion today on early immune checkpoint inhibitor cardiotoxicity. This case will be presented by Dr. Han Zhu, who is an instructor at Stanford Cardiovascular Medicine, and we are joined today by esteemed members of our editorial board, including Dr. Ron Wittellis, also from Stanford, Dr. Anna Barak from MedStar, Dr. Ann Blaze from the University of Minnesota, and Dr. Dan Lenahan from Washington University in St. Louis. In Jack Carter Oncology, we have a number of pieces on immune therapy cardiotoxicity, given the importance of this topic, including many original research pieces, even clinical cases, in a state-of-the-art review. I encourage you all to read these pieces about this topic in our journal. With that, Han, uh, please take it away and tell us about your case. Thanks, Bonnie. So next slide. Can we advance the slide, please? Thank you. So this is a 76-year-old gentleman with stage three lung adenocarcinoma and no prior cardiac history who received standard of care radiation and chemotherapy, followed by initiation of the immune checkpoint inhibitor Dervalimab at 10 mg per kg biweekly as adjuvant therapy. On routine monitoring add-on labs after 10 weeks of Dervalimab for his fifth dose of Dervalimab, he incidentally had a markedly elevated troponin of 1.232 nanograms per mil with no baseline for comparison. The patient was called back urgently for repeat labs, and on repeat check, his troponin was down at 0.145 nanograms per mil. He reported no chest pain, shortness of breath, or other cardiac symptoms, and reported feeling fine. He also had no other symptoms of autoimmunity, including rash, diarrhea, joint or muscle aches, and he had normal liver function tests and thyroid function tests. He was also a non-smoker. His hemoglobin A1C is 5.6, and his total LDL cholesterol is 125, and HDL is 83. Next slide. So on EKG, he had normal sinus rhythm with no ischemic ST or T wave changes or Q wave. Uh, next slide, please. And on transthoracic echocardiogram, uh, he had a normal preserved uh, left ventricular ejection fraction of 56% and no wall motion abnormality. Next slide, please. So my question for the panel now is, what do you make of his findings so far and what other diagnostic tests would you recommend? Dan, what would you do in this situation? Or Ron, Anna, Anne? Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a real challenging question, and it's just like one I had on Tuesday. So, uh, you know, you always wonder whether the troponin is, you know, uh, 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 a red herring or it's it's not uh, not a real finding. But then I also think you can't ignore them. So, especially when it's substantially abnormal. So, with no symptoms, a normal heart. You know, echo and an EKG that's pretty unremarkable. Uh, I guess I would probably, uh, what I've been doing lately to just see if I can understand which patients are at risk, I would add a CRP and a SED rate to his labs, and then I would consider whether an MRI would be useful at this point. I uh, I would uh, uh, concur with those sentiments. I think the challenge in these patients uh, is w when you put a screening strategy like this, and I suspect we'll get into a discussion about whether we should screen, but uh, in a case like this, you know, if the second troponin value had been the one that was there, I think one would have been tempted to ignore it, but it's, it's hard to with that first troponin value, which uh, clearly falls into the abnormal range, and the second one still a little bit abnormal, making you think the first wasn't just a laboratory error. Um, uh, of course, he could have significant coronary disease, and this could be demand ischemia, but his being completely well uh, would make that less likely. And so I concur, I think my next test at that point would be a cardiac MRI. Yeah, I would probably just add, you know, I think this is where you need close collaboration between HEMONC and cardiology. Um, this is also, as Ron mentioned, Part of where I think as an oncologist, we 
get really nervous about screening biomarkers um, as part of care because what you don't want is to delay therapy for somebody. You certainly want to pay attention to it, but if you have a therapy that you think is going to improve outcomes on somebody, um, the goal is to try to continue that from an oncologic perspective. So I think close collaboration with cardiology in a situation like this, this is where I get on the phone. I call my cardio-oncologist um, for direction and guidance on how to move forward. Okay. Yeah, I, I can just uh, quickly comment. Is a, I think MRI is always a great idea, uh, not only because I, I read them, uh, but the, the biggest question is what is the next proponent going to be, right? Are we catching something dynamic? And I think we would all be afraid are we missing something? And we all know that a normal echo doesn't really roll that out. The fact that the echo is normal and the EKG is normal makes you think, well, I'm not facing something rapidly progressive and the second proponent has dropped. But I don't think this is a, a, a the threshold that we would say, well, it's going down, let's send the patient home. So two points in addition to thinking of the MRI, I would also try to ask if the patient by any chance that morning had uh, exertion, we've had patients go to the gym or run. I know it's not typical for many of the patients receiving cancer therapies, but they, they, they t they t many tend to feel fine on immune checkpoint inhibitors, and we've certainly seen non-specific specific elevations of troponin in this range due to, for example, exercise. Great points by everyone. So just to summarize the key points at this, this time. So close collaboration is key, not to ignore this elevated troponin. It deserves some additional diagnostic workup. And I heard from everyone that most, that they think that MR would be the next step. Huh? Take it, give it yeah. back to you. Yes, thank you for all the excellent discussion. Actually, that's exactly what we did. So. Um, so, uh, cardio oncology, so we have a team that kind of responds to the positive troponin, so we got involved and we went ahead and got a cardiac MRI. So, um, next slide, please. So, thin A uh, four chamber view showed uh, focal thinning hypokinesis in the basal lateral wall, and he also had a small pericardial effusion. And the second panel, you show the four chamber delayed enhancement MRI. Uh, which was also abnormal with um, some LGE in the basal lateral wall. Um, and then in the third panel was the T2-weighted uh, short axis that did show subtle hyperintensity uh, concerning for myocardial edema. And this was more in the anterior lateral wall. Uh, so next slide. So now, based on this information, uh, what level of suspicion do you have for ICI-associated cardiotoxicity? And if so, what kind? Would you consider initiation of steroids? And what recommendations would you have for the oncologist in terms of the immunotherapy? Thanks, Han. I think it's helpful here to just even take a step back and take a pause. I think every time many of us we hear the word ICI, we cardiotoxicity, we think myocarditis, number one. But there are other cardiotoxic effects of these therapies. Uh, Dan, would you want to elaborate or Ron, Anna? Uh, Talk to everyone about what are the other cardiovascular effects of uh, ICI cardiotoxicity that can be observed in patients, and what else also should be on the difference? Yeah, I think that this is this is like my favorite question, or close to it, because you know you have uh, you really have to have a good baseline assessment of this patient. So chances are very likely that seeing that he had lung cancer and he was placed on ICI therapy, that he's got underlying atherosclerosis that's probably extensive. And whether you were properly managing that as a baseline, you know, aspirin and a statin and whatever other uh, coronary disease type medications you may think are necessary. But so I think anytime you have a troponin elevation, you have to always consider whether ischemic heart disease is part of the equation. I'd say the pericardial effusion could certainly go along with him having some component of pericarditis as well, although, again, we heard he's not uh, he's symptomatic. Um, I'll also highlight that as a patient with lung cancer, he has undoubtedly had uh, chest CTs that one could go back and look and see if he had significant coronary calcification. Mm -hmm. 
um, and that would uh, certainly help you stratify how likely this is to be ischemic or not, although the pattern obviously would not be typical uh, for that. Uh, I would certainly uh, defer uh, to Anna in terms of uh, the uh, her interpretation of the MRI and how uh, how distinctive this pattern would be for ICI toxicity. These are these are excellent points, and this is a very nice MRI showing the key uh, things. So there are there are three characteristics in MRI that one can look. One is similar to echo. So uh, uh, if this person were to have a, a, a function abnormalities such as either regional or global, that would be one of the criteria. And that could be seen on the echo. MRI tends to be more sensitive for regional uh, abnormalities when you look, although this echo was very nice and probably would have caught it as well. So that was negative. However, two other components are positive findings on this uh, image. So if we look, if you want to go back, that would be nice to for just to have a, a discussion if we can go one slide back. So the panel in the middle is a lead gadolinium enhancement, and you're seeing nicely in the lateral wall, it's patchy. It does, it is transmural, so differential diagnosis for transmural lead gadolinium enhancement does include myocardial infarction, and that could be that blind spot that sometimes could be a circumflex. However, there's really no uh, pre predominant subendocardial component. Infarcts tend to look more in the subendocardium, and then in the clinical picture, nothing was really pointing. So I think that putting together clinical and this MRI pattern, this would be probably favoring uh, myocarditis, even just statistically looking at it. And again, pattern for true myocarditis, you would like to have another little pattern just like this. So if you would have two areas that are in two different coronary territories with uh, enhancement like that, then it is really myocarditis pattern, uh, unlike proven otherwise. So I'm putting here a little bit my hat of an imager. So as an imager, you cannot just give this a diagnosis of myocarditis because it could be other things. But I think based on what you, everything else you said, uh, this is the myocarditis, uh, uh, most consistent myocarditis. And then what you're nicely showing is the um, qualitative assessment of T2. So in your third uh, a slide is a, a T2 weighted image, which is typical for edema. I have to say that if this patient had a circumflex territory uh, uh, infarct, it would look very similar. So brightness on T2 is consistent with edema and not specific with uh, myocarditis. Again, if we were to have another little area uh, of, a, of a T2 positivity in another uh, coronary territory, you would say, oh, this is absolutely consistent with myocarditis. But I think with your clinical picture, you are having what we call Lake Louise criteria, would, would this would be uh, uh, consistent with uh, myocarditis. And I will just, so we, we talked a little bit about the whole group uh, uh, getting together. So different centers have different people reading cardiac MRIs. And this is very important to uh, ask the imagers to include, if this myocarditis is uh, suspected, to include different projections. So your last panel is a T2. And that that is not always, as you can tell here, we have a single slice. So if, unless you've done the whole imaging of the heart, in the T2 uh, image, you will miss. For example, if you showed me a slice more apical, you can clearly see that you likely would have missed that. So it's important that the entire uh, heart is covered in both late gadolinium and T2 uh, weighted images. And of course, if one would have a qualitative so uh, uh, assessment such as parametric imaging, you would have here a value of T2. It would show in these nice colors that we when we try to promote MRI, we have to put them out there, but it would be brighter in that area, and we could give it a number. So uh, uh, we, when we started screening or using the MRI for identification of these patients, you want to make sure that you have T2, late GAD in uh, different projections, and then, if possible, also include qualitative assessment for T2. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Brock. And actually, the read that you gave was pretty exactly how it was given here, too. Most likely consistent with myocarditis, but, you know, could consider a small embolic infarct in the third territory. And, um, and Dr. Lanahan, we definitely thought about the, the risk for coronary disease as well. So that was also what we were thinking on our differential. Uh, next slide, please. So before we go further, and then next, another slide. 
Um, before we go further into this patient's case, I just want to take a step back and highlight a paper that is being published in Jack Cardio Oncology by Zang et al. and Dr. Nealon's group at MGH, where they effectively really summarize the published data on the epidemiology, diagnosis, and management of the cardiotoxicity of ICIs. And in this uh, illustration from the paper, they show the molecular mechanism of the new checkpoint inhibitor. So ICIs are monoclonal antibodies that act on tumor cells by blocking inherent uh, immune stopping points on T cells, such as CTLA-4 or PD-1, PDL-1 pathway and allows for T cell activation and cytotoxicity against tumor cells. And as such, they really revolutionize the treatment of many advanced cancers. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this is a central illustration from the Zhang et al. paper that highlights some important concepts in this field. So as you can see, we really only hit the tip of the iceberg in terms of the range of cardiotoxicity that could occur with ICI. And it's important to keep a broad differential and it is necessary to collect a comprehensive set of cardiac data that includes history and physical, EKG biomarkers, echo with GLS, um, cardiac MRI with parametric mapping and pathology when it indicated. Um, and they also do uh, summarize in the paper the effect of the wide spectrum of ICI-associated cardiotoxicities that's been characterized so far in the literature uh, in addition to myocarditis, and that includes conduction disease, systolic dysfunction, pericardial disease, acute coronary syndrome, and there's been some evidence actually now for accelerated atherosclerosis as well. On the right, you can see uh, their proposed diagnostic algorithm for ICI myocarditis, which remains one of the most fulminant and devastating cardiac complications of ICI. So, for patients that are on ICI or have had recent ICI use um, with a change in cardiac symptoms um, and or abnormal EKG or troponin, they recommend um, obtaining some initial tests, uh, so EKG, troponin, BNP, echo. And then if the patient is unstable, they do recommend immediate cardiac catheterization with chemodynamic assessment and biopsy is recommended to confirm or exclude the diagnosis of myocarditis. For the stable patient, which is our case, um, after alternative etiologies such as ACS have been ruled out, a cardiac MRI um, may be reasonable. And then if the MRI is normal, uh, but a high clinical suspicion persists, then a biopsy may be considered. And I thought it was interesting um, to note that, I guess, in contrast to patients with non-ICI etiologies of myocarditis, where they can have up to 80% of patients with FLGE, in this specific population, only 23 to 48% of patients um, with ICI myocarditis may have LGE on MRI, and maybe only 28% um, reported in some studies have abnormal T2 signal. So um, still keeping a high index of suspicion, although MRI is a very useful tool. Um, and then they did suggest some alternative MRI strategies like T1, T2 mapping, which may help improve diagnostic uh, value. Uh, next slide. Um, and because of the potentially fatal nature of ICI-associated cardiotoxicity, and these patients classically have often presented late when the disease is already severe, there has been a question of whether ongoing routine screening with biomarkers such as troponin may be useful in early identification. Uh, current guidelines support baseline troponin and EKG and BNP measurement, but there's a discussion about whether uh, some of these measurements should be ongoing even after initiation of therapy. Um, I want to highlight here another paper that's coming out in Jack Cardio Oncology uh, by Tanmi and Patella et al. Um, they propose the following screening algorithm for ICI uh, monitoring. So in this algorithm, they broke it down into two proposed strategies. So strategy one, which is preferred, is actually to obtain ECG, troponin, and cardiac symptoms uh, with each dose of immunotherapy, and then in proceeding with cardio-oncology consult and evaluation if abnormal. Uh, this strategy does um, require adjudication, and, it was, and we've been actually trying something similar here at Stanford. The second strategy, uh, which is an alternative, is to screen for cardiovascular symptoms with each dose, and then obtaining ECG troponin if the symptoms are abnormal, followed by cardio-oncology consult. Uh, next slide. Ahan, uh -huh, maybe yeah. we can see pause here though and just talk ask the panel of experts who's sure, doing yeah. routine screening yeah at your institution and also how would you have managed that patient? Would you have started steroid and what dose and, and so forth? Okay. 
I just want to add to that in terms of the questioning, you know, from the HEMONC perspective, I also think some of our patients on, we talked about this gentleman who probably has coronary disease um, and is, um, I would say, a, a higher risk patient compared to your patient with metastatic melanoma who's 35 getting immunotherapy. And just to add to that question, are you treating them in terms of screening and with biomarkers the same way? Yeah. So, you know, I think if, from my perspective, uh, the first thing is to recognize that we really do not have the good data to guide this right now. So it's very much right now in the opinion based. Uh, I think, you know, as, as Han was noting, we have been trying to do an algorithm at, at Stanford and, and uh, this patient, uh, that's how he was picked up. Uh, I would say what we have clearly learned is that you better have a really well thought out and very responsive team uh, because lots of troponin positives will come in, not necessarily this dramatic. And uh, because it's something like a positive troponin, it's got to be adjudicated in real time. So, you know, I think for any centers uh, that are thinking about starting a screening protocol, uh, which, you know, we feel may have some utility, but there's certainly not the evidence to clearly drive it yet. Uh, the word of caution would be to make sure that you have a good system set up before you before you start it. That's an excellent point. There's a great need for further research. And that viewpoint that we're publishing is, is also just that. It's a viewpoint from the French working group that is really a call for more data. Yeah. And I, if I if I may add, I think this is really speaking the 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 two pro approaches speak much more of the vastly different systems of care. Uh, uh, I think it's no no secret that, that even just within the U.S. and let alone other countries, we have very different ways of how many patients come through the door. How are they? How is the uh, consult and collaboration of care exist? So I think that when when those strategies are done, they're by no means to uh, evidence proven, but there are attempts to understand and identify those predictors. So I think it's going to be wonderful to see in the years to come uh, which strategy actually leads to improved care. And right now, they're really just, uh, I think, uh, there for people to consider. And just like Ron said, the, the moment you say, let's check troponin in everybody, you better have a strategy of what's going to happen when troponin comes back positive on a Friday night. Are you going to call the patient call home? What is going to be the threshold? How often are you going to follow telemetry? Are you going to admit them, send them home with a, a, a monitor? I mean, there are a lot of things to, to, to think through. I think that goes to Anne's point as well on a very well stated and also, of course, by Ron, but uh, Anne also raised that point about it, that need for close collaboration and undoubtedly there is a need for it to clearly define how to take care of these patients with uh, undoubtedly a need for more research. How what I'm curious how you guys would have managed this patient. Steroids, what dose? Dan, Ron? Yeah, I think that if you had asked me what I would do the first time that the troponin was elevated, so on uh September 9th, then I might have said one thing. I probably would have pursued certainly pursued the MRI and at whatever level I could do it, but I wouldn't I wouldn't have considered making it any kind of stat study. But then uh, on the 23rd, where you have these troponins that are markedly elevated, that's a different story. And I think that in this situation, I would say you better treat this as an emergency. So uh, I would admit this patient, give them high dose steroids, and uh, make sure they're on telemetry and and watch them very carefully. Yeah, yeah I've, been, I've been struck by our oncology colleagues that for non-cardiac uh, in, inflammatory consequences of, uh, of ICI therapy, that there's usually quite a low threshold to start steroids, that it doesn't take much to say, hey, and I'm curious what Ann uh, would say about this. Um, and, you know, I think, it, to my mind, when you combine the troponin on September 9th, once you have the MRI that looks so consistent, you know, I think from my standpoint, yes, then if I'm there in that moment, I probably would have. Although then, of course, on the 16th, you might have thought if you saw that person and they hadn't been started on steroids, well, good thing I didn't because it seems to be calming down on its own. And, of course, we'll, we'll go on and see that, that that's not the case. So I, I think, though, with the clear imaging evidence consistent with myocarditis, um, and a positive proponent to me, that would be meet the threshold to start steroids. 
I think from the Hemong perspective, I, you know, well, in this case, hindsight is 2020, but, um, you know, when it was elevated on the 9th, as you mentioned, I think most of us, first of all, we would have called our cardiology colleagues and really said, could this be something else? And we've kind of talked about that. And if the feeling was, no, this is really um, ICI myocarditis, I think most of us would have had a low threshold to at least start oral steroids, like a milligram per kilogram. I think by the time you look at it, there would have been discussion about that in terms of the patient was asymptomatic, but I agree with you, Ron, most of us probably would have had a low threshold to at least start oral. By the time you get to the 23rd, I think the patient needs admitted and IV steroids based on um, where, where we're at. Even though the patient is asymptomatic, I think with such a dramatic increase, um, that would probably be what most of us would all be comfortable with. I'm really glad that we're having this discussion because I think that we all face this every day and you always wonder what would other uh, uh, faces do. One quick uh, question. So if this were an outpatient, for example, uh, and you've done it in the routine screening, would, the, would you bring the patient in? And Dan said, well, I wouldn't rush with the MRI. If you if you order a routine MRI in many places, this is going to happen two weeks from now. Like, you have to pull <laughs> But, no, I, wouldn't. I, I think I would qualify that statement to just say, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the truly routine MRI is going to get done six weeks from now, but the I would not make this a routine MRI. I just wouldn't make it a stat one on November, on, on September 9th. But on the 23rd, you know, where there's such a clear change in your troponin, I mean, right now the outcomes for people that have you know, possible, probable, or severe, uh, or diagnostic uh, myocarditis, 50% of them die in, in, you know, 30 days or so. So, I mean, it's a very bad diagnosis. So, in this moment, for this patient, I would say this is the most immediately life-threatening condition, and, and, you know, on the 23rd of September. So, you know, that's, that's then, but Two weeks earlier, I don't know. It's tough. I don't know what to say there because I might have, I might have probably, you know, chances are I probably would have sent the guy for a cath and possible biopsy if if I thought that the troponin was real. So a question to Han: What happened between 16th? Was the patient at home? Yeah. So um, the extra layer here was actually this. Patient, as Ron mentioned, was in our first wave of uh, training and screening. And uh, when initially we were initiating it, and as Ron stated, we were very careful in starting with a small patient population. And we actually um, attached, so we actually know about these troponins before even the oncology team because we actually attached a pager to it and we get, you know, immediate notification. This particular patient, we actually also, in order to have a, I guess, we wanted to, you know, we started with the thoracic oncology group. We actually also added troponins as an add-on lab. So this troponin was actually added on several days after it was drawn. And so as soon as we saw that it came back markedly elevated, we called the patient to make sure, you know, he was fine and he was. And we called him back immediately for the repeat troponin, which was already down at 0.145. Then we got the MRI the next day. He was still an inpatient. He didn't want it to be admitted. Understandably, he felt fine. And then uh, between the 16th and the 23rd, um, we decided to watch him. And on the 23rd, we repeated a troponin because that's when he would have gotten a repeat um, dose of Dervalimab. And that's when it came back at 10.3. And then we admitted him. So um, great discussion so far and really excellent points. And uh, I agree with all of those. Uh, so in terms of our patient, um, we ended up admitting him. And actually, first and foremost, we wanted to rule out ACS at this point. Like if there was a sort of lesion that, you know, somehow somehow correlates with this. So uh, we actually ended up getting a coronary CT. Um, so move to the next slide. And we chose CT because uh, oh, EKG was still the same. Uh, next slide. And echo. So this also um, contributed to our thought process. So there was a question now in the new echo of whether there was some posterolateral hypokinesis compared to the old. Uh, and it's subtle. Uh, if we could play that again or go back. 
So his EF overall was still preserved, um, and I, in the read, there was a call of possible in, uh, posterior lateral hypokinesis, so that um, contributed to our thought process. And then next slide. Uh, we actually already talked about this, so we can go next as well. Thank you. So then we did the coronary CT. And actually, so you can see in these curved multiplanar reconstructions that his coronaries were clean uh, and his calcium score was zero. And we did have a suspicion of that, too, on the non-gated CT scans, even when, on our initial evaluation. But we thought, you know, it's non-gated and even we don't see any calcium, but who knows, could be something. And then in this, uh, you know, coronary CT scan, there wasn't uh, calcium score of zero and no coronary disease. Uh, so then next slide. Okay, so now how would you approach this patient given this new information? A lot of steroids. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, I think we've already covered our thought process. Um, so we, if you actually go to the next slide, we actually have a. a I mean, um, you know, honestly, I would, I would say, you know, at 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 our institution where I'm very comfortable with you know, their ability to do a biopsy, I, I think I would have done a biopsy first. So, Dan, it's interesting. Oh, biopsy, because I think if we have now, I, I thought of it earlier, particularly if we were thinking of re-challenging and the, if there were doubts, but now we have clean coronaries, troponin, which is rising, MRI consists with myocarditis. Do we need biopsy to call this myocarditis? No. Okay. No, I don't think so. But yeah. no, I'm I I'm, also, I'm all about like goal, goal diagnosis. I I feel that we always learn with biopsy, and it's just an invasive test. And, uh, and you know, when you talk to the patients, we we try. We feel that there is a low risk, particularly in transplant centers that that do biopsies routinely for transplant patients. There are operators who have huge experience. Um, but I was even even my oncology colleagues, they were always like, like, no, if this is myocarditis, we are going to treat it as myocarditis and continue. Why would you expose patients to even any risk to confirm the diagnosis? Yeah, and I'm and, and I think, you know, I'm more on that end as well, that that I just don't know what finding we would see unless we found some completely bizarre, unexpected finding that had nothing to do with this, which just seems so unlikely that would change our thoughts. Uh, this is, if it, it, it saw that where it was on the imaging uh, is a place that um, if you do a, just an RV biopsy, uh, I think very low chance of finding anything. And, you know, and if you're going to go to an LV biopsy, obviously now you're uh, significantly raising the risk up further. So, but once again, right, there's no data. So, so I think it's, it falls into the zone where it's still reasonable for different centers to have different approaches to this. Yeah, and I would just add, I think from the from the HEMOC perspective, um, those doses of methylpred, uh, we're not afraid of those. So I would say um, we'd, you know, be in favor of going ahead with it. Great. Thank you. So um, before we talk about what we did for this patient, um, again, I want to draw your attention to this paper by Zang et al., um, where they highlight a proposed treatment algorithm for ICI myocarditis. And so the, it's really separated into three patient groups, um, patients who are stable, um, patients who are unstable, and then patients who are stable, but the therapy is ineffective. Uh, so for the first group of patients, you know, it's recommendation for everybody, it's recommended that ICI is discontinued. And then for the patients who are stable and therapy is effective, um, you know, presumably you have started methylprednisolone of one gram per day. Um, after three to five days, if the troponin is downtrending, then they can be transitioned to oral prednisone at one to two milligrams per kg with a slow taper by about 10 mg per week and close serial troponin surveillance. In the middle group, for patients who are unstable, um, they should be managed in conjunction with advanced heart failure consult and, you know, if they have cardiogenic shock, then supported with uh, mechanical support as necessary. And these are the patients that you really want to consider adjunct immunosuppression, including CTLA-4 agonists, such as at bad effect, um, alemcizumab, ATG, plasmapheresis, and IG IVIG. And similarly, on the right category, for patients who are stable but Let's say they have ongoing markers of inflammation uh, and don't seem to be responding to this initial burst of steroids. The algorithm does recommend 
uh, increasing the dose to twice daily of steroids, and if still ineffective, then proceeding with biopsy confirmation, and then proceeding down the route of CTLA-4 agonist, et cetera. So that's kind of the general uh, proposed scheme. And then next slide, please. So this is what happened to our patient. So um, he was admitted and it was actually, again, very stable, but we did initiate high-dose steroids. And you can see that he did respond um, pretty quickly. So we actually transitioned him very quickly to oral prednisone. And uh, by 24 hours uh, of prednisone, his troponin had downtrended to 5.8 and then kept downtrending. And so he was discharged with a six-week prednisone taper and weekly lap, so weekly troponin uh, and CK. Uh, and then two months after discharge, he was uh, complete. So he was free of uh, any cardiac complications, no heart failure symptoms. His EF was stable. His troponin was now undetectable. And from a cancer perspective, he was still off his immunotherapy uh, with no signs of uh, cancer progression. And now, actually, it's been a year, and um, he still remains off immunotherapy without any cancer progression. Uh, next slide. So um, my question for the panel. So what recommendations, if you had been seeing this patient, let's say, right after discharge and he was on, you know, tapered off of prednisone, uh, what would you recommend to the oncologist about his immunotherapy and what would be your thought process surrounding that? And then what kind of follow-up do you think he needs? So, Han, could I uh, uh, just interject one question that comes to me often from oncology, even before we come to the therapy, uh, is uh, how do you go about safety of discharge? Like, is there a, a safe number? For example, you showed very, the qu very quick drop in troponin on a high-dose uh, steroids, and I think uh, high, uh, so three to five days, and they are so, is it three or five? And what, what should you use? What do you, what, what should we use as a, a lack of responsiveness to therapy in patients who are hemodynamically stable? So, I mean, the only thing that was really abnormal in him was a troponin, right? I mean, we are not going to, uh, cardiac MRI findings are not going to go away for some time. So, uh, uh, and then how do we go around, for example, would you discharge home a patient on oral prednisone if troponin is still two, to give it a number? Uh, uh, I think that's reasonable. And then often these patients need to be followed, right, by oncologists or cardiologists. How do you go around those numbers? Do you have, I would be curious what you do and, and, uh, and Dan, what, what happens at your institutions? Because yeah. these are the questions that I get from oncology. Uh, yeah, those are great questions. And I, I definitely love to throw those to the panel as well. And I, for this patient too, you know, I, I want to just also bring up that one other question we had was, yes, his biomarker is downtrended quickly. Um, he was also on telemetry monitoring, and there was a question of how long should we be monitoring this guy for arrhythmias, because that's also another thing, uh, yeah. you know, another thing of on, ongoing inflammation. So those were the exact questions that came up. And, you know, when we had him, uh, you know, stable with downtrending biomarkers, and I think, I don't remember the exact troponin level that we discharged him on, but uh, it, it seemed pretty confidently going in the right direction on, on the prednisone and, you know, on oral prednisone. And, uh, you know, um, the other thing was he had no evidence of arrhythmias on telemetry. And, you know, I think at that point we felt that he was going in the right direction. And so, but I would love to throw that to the panel and, and get yeah, I, and I think it's difficult to have an exact cut point, but exact, it's the entire clinical picture because of you know, the lack of data. We don't have data that says this troponin is associated with this sensitivity specificity of, you know, an adverse outcome in this specific population. Um, but it's such a it's such a great question and just a call and a cry for the need for additional data, certainly. So any any thresholds like for example, Anne, if if you are seeing this patient on a, on inpatient consult and you are sending him home, you would send him home on a taper. For example, we are calling this response. I think we would all uh, agree with that, and we would send him home on a taper. For example, discharge after three days, uh, uh, the patient can go home on prednisone of 60, and you would start start slow six week taper. Uh, and as long as troponin is going down, we wouldn't worry. Uh, and it, let's say that we are relatively safe because telemetry was fine. I guess everybody was, of course, afraid of sudden death. 
that's a uh, and I think you know um, ASCO has very good guidelines for the management of um, ICI toxicity. I think it obviously is not going to tell you when to send somebody home, uh, but I think many factors go into that. I think the fact that they um, you're seeing downward trending, I think if the patient continues to be asymptomatic and you have a, a close follow-up discharge plan, I think that we would be comfortable doing that. We're very used to um, tapering steroids in the follow-up period. And I think, you know, one of the things, both with the initial troponins, but also in this situation now, sometimes what also comes into that conversation are factors of social determinants of health. Um, you know, does the patient, are they going to come back into clinic for close follow-up? And clearly, if it's a patient who uh, has close follow-up, has support around them, I would feel very comfortable as they're downward trending to send them home. Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, I mean, uh, once the troponin is coming down, then you're really just talking about the arrhythmic risk, uh, right? Because otherwise, if they have the capacity to come back frequently, you could have them come in daily for a troponin check at first to make sure it's continuing to go the right direction. Um, and so it's really, I think, once the troponin's coming down, and if you haven't seen any hints of malignant arrhythmias, and obviously assuming that the, they're not having any significant symptoms, from my standpoint, that would be the, the threshold one to do so. Great. So since I hijacked the hands question, I want to <laughs> tell it what we would with respect to uh, uh, immunotherapy. I think uh, what you are showing uh, clearly in this uh, uh, patient and makes it easy, but I think that reflects the practice that many of us are seeing that the anti-tumor effects of uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors tend to last for longer. Uh, I think this patient did have uh, uh, myocarditis and that would probably unless there's a, a strong argument that there's no uh, better alternative therapy for concern of the cancer progression, I think we would advise not to use any of the uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, down the road uh, as, a, as a general recommendation. Of course, I mean, the, the, this can always be revisited depending on you know, how uh, grave uh, uh, or which clinical path it takes, but I think that the recommendation would be in the in light that the patient developed uh, immune-related uh, adverse events of uh, this severity. Uh, I think that the recommendation would be that at least it needs to be discussed before restarting. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that's also just emphasizes the need for that close collaboration with cardiology and oncology to say, does the patient first of all do they need other therapy? Are there other options? Um, and that can really vary depending on the patient's clinical situation. Like here, it can also vary by disease type where some cancers like breast cancer, where we're using immunotherapy in the first line metastatic setting. There are a lot of other treatment options where someone with melanoma, for example, where there are a lot of immunotherapy based treatments that seem to have the best efficacy you might be having a slightly different conversation. So that joint collaboration is really important. Yeah, I would I would uh, echo the the whole point about you know if you if you have some toxicity from immunotherapy then you know and it's relatively mild then chances are you're going to potentially reconsider checkpoint inhibitor therapy down the road depending on the cancer but unfortunately I would say myocarditis is a hard stop. And at this point, uh, I would say you should really think about alternative therapy in, in this particular patient. I will give a very short story of a patient that we took care of that had uh, metastatic renal cell cancer, and uh, the, the disease was progressing, and they had put her on a checkpoint inhibitor. Uh, she developed a significantly abnormal MRI and troponin, but she also had coronary disease, so we capped her and did a biopsy. And uh, in the end, we uh, decided that she had myocarditis. Uh, even though it wasn't 100% clear, it was still pretty clear. And she was not given any more checkpoint inhibitor for about two or three months. And then the cancer continued to progress, and the oncologist felt very strongly that that was the only available effective therapy for this particular patient. 
And I said, well, you know, we would say myocarditis is a hard stop. I would probably not recommend doing it. <clears throat> the oncologist had a frank discussion with the patient. And they decided to do it anyway because they didn't have any other therapy. And, you know, the patient died suddenly at home two weeks later uh, in her sleep. So, you know, what 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 do we learn from that? That, you know, I think that myocarditis is a bad diagnosis. So I would say be very careful ever using a checkpoint inhibitor again. But, you know, there may be some extreme circumstance when you might agree with it, I suppose. I could not agree more. And I think there are great points for lessons, both for the oncology audience and as well I've learned for cardiology audience, <laughs> which often I've heard cardiology colleagues say, but, you know, if the cancer progresses, there is nothing else that can be done. True, but it one needs to look. We've had a number of examples of patients who developed a reaction. Well, in this case, myocarditis, but we had instance of bad pneumonitis, hypophysitis after the first dose, with excellent tumor response lasting into two years. So, and these were measurable tumors that went away and did not come back in diagnosis, including melanoma. So I'm by no means trying to generalize here. I don't think we can draw any generalized conclusions, uh, but I think it's it's not, it, it's very different uh, uh, tumor response than to other therapies. Sometimes you can uh, anticipate longer effect because it's not that you, the, the, the T cells have awakened. I mean, they, they will do, if they started doing something, they will do it. Uh, so the decision on reinitiation of therapy has to be very carefully examined, both from by a cardiology saying this was really most likely myocarditis, uh, and by oncology saying, well, this is uh, what are other options and how are we going to follow this patient? Well, thank you so much, everyone. I know we could talk for hours and hours on end on this really important topic. I just want you to summarize a few key takeaways. Uh, point. So ICI uh, can result in a number of cardiotoxicities we discussed, uh, arrhythmia, cardiopathy, uh, so forth. But the highest, the one of greatest concern is certainly myocarditis because of the significant central morbidity and mortality that it causes. Most would use troponin as a screening tool. However, the use of systematically screening troponin in all ICI patients uh, will need a lot of data and absolutely requires a pathway in terms of how to handle that if one were to use that type of strategy. Again, certainly need more data here. Uh, ruling out acute coronary syndrome is an important first step when you see an elevated troponin. And I think most on the panel would agree that CMR would also be an important diagnostic uh, step uh, the, coupled with parametric mapping. Um, Careful, close follow-up and collaboration, certainly with oncology and cardiology, and of course, also involving the patient in all of these decisions. And I hear from the panel, the expert panel, that we challenge with ICI really uh, heeds a lot of caution and uh, needs to be, be would need to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis if, uh, if if that were thought were to be uh, entertained and uh, and really. Uh, just heed a lot of caution with that. Um, with that, I did want to thank uh, everyone. Uh, uh, Han, uh, excellent case. Uh, thank you, Anna, Dan, Anne, and Ron for all of your expertise and uh, thoughtful discussion. And thank you to our Jack Carter Oncology community. I hope you learned uh, a great deal from this excellent case. Thank you. <laughs>